Hello and welcome to your video lecture on the endocrine system, which is chapter 17 in your OpenStax textbook. We'll start off with section 17.1 for an introduction to the endocrine system and hormones. So our endocrine system is going to consist of our organs that are able to release hormones in order to maintain homeostasis. If you remember what homeostasis is, it kind of keeps that balance set point for certain areas of our body. For instance, our body temperature, our pH level within our blood or our tissues, our, let's say in relation to endocrine, our amount of calcium that we have within our blood, the amount of glucose within our blood, and all of that. We want it at a homeostasis level so it works in harmony with our nervous system so that we can coordinate all of these activities. And the field in which we're going to study in, um, in the endocrine system and focus on treatment of endocrine system disorders is endocrinology. So let's compare the endocrine system and the nervous system. They both are working to help coordinate and integrate the activities of our body cells, but our endocrine system does this very slowly because it takes time. We have to release the hormones from our pituitary gland. It then travels through the blood, makes it over to a target endocrine gland, which then maybe has to release another hormone to trigger the actual mechanism that we want. So it takes a long time, but it lasts as a longer response. Whereas with our nervous system, we have rapid activity, right? That information is going to travel through a nerve impulse and release a neurotransmitter and we get a rapid response. So the response typically is not going to be long lasting like it is with our endocrine system. Now let's talk about some of the mechanisms of intracellular communication. When we have direct communication, it's typically through our gap junctions. These can use ions or small solutes and other lipids to go through the gap junctions and serve as a chemical mediator. The effects are limited to adjacent cells because the cells have to be next to one another to use the gap junction and they're interconnected through the connexons. And then we have our paracrine communication through our extracellular fluids. Now, even though this communication is moving through fluids, we still have to be near the, or these cells have to be, <laughs> excuse me, near one another. In fact, para, the prefix here, means next to or side by side. And so we're going to use these paracrine factors as chemical mediators, and our effects are primarily limited to the local area, as we said, so near one another. Um, where we are going to see the concentrations will be pretty high. And our target cells have to have the appropriate receptor on it. We don't have an image depicting these receptors, but imagine they are extending out on what looks like to be these smooth muscle cells. Now for endocrine communication, this takes place through the bloodstream. So think of the bloodstream as kind of like a highway for these hormones serving as chemical mediators, and they are going to travel through the bloodstream in order to reach their target cell or target tissues. And they, of course, have to have the appropriate receptor once again that is not depicted here, but we know it exists. And then we've got our neural communication. Neural, of course, referring to our neurons. So we're gonna see a release through the synaptic cleft. To refresh your memory, the synaptic cleft is gonna be that space between the axon terminals here and the dendrites or cell body of the next neuron. And so our chemical mediator here are neurotransmitters that move through that synaptic cleft, and the effects are limited to very specific areas because we have such a close relationship between the terminal axon and the next neuron. And once again, we have to have the appropriate receptors here on the dendrites or the cell body to pick up this neurotransmitter. 
So next, let's talk about the structures of the endocrine system. We're going to focus on the brain first. And so we've zoomed into this diencephalon area so that we can see the hypothalamus right along in here. Then we have our pineal gland, which I always talk about the pineal gland kind of being the tail of the hypo, um, excuse me, the tail of the thalamus. So right along in here, kind of oval shaped, we would have the thalamus and right posterior to it, we have the pineal gland. Now let's go back to that hypothalamus. That's going to be this triangular shaped structure right along in here. And at the very tip of that triangle, we would have our pituitary gland, which is also known as the master gland because it will release a ton of hormones that we'll talk about in a little bit. Moving past the brain and into the neck region, we can see here this bow tie shaped gland is going to serve as our thyroid gland. Behind that, we have three, or sorry, three, not, not three, but four small glands. So posterior to the thyroid gland, we have four small glands, which are the parathyroid glands, which I just realized is not on this list. Okay, there we go. I've added it here to number four, just so it does not change the numbering on your notes. So we've got your parathyroid glands that sit posterior to your thyroid gland. Now these glands can range from two to six, but typically we find four of them. As we move down the area of the neck and into the thorax, sitting more on the heart, which isn't pictured here, is going to be the thymus. So we're gonna add that at number five. That's our thymus serves as an endocrine gland. Moving further in the abdomen and posteriorly in the abdomen, we are gonna find our adrenal glands, which I always like to call the party hats to our kidneys. And sitting right across the abdomen, we have the pancreas. And lastly, we have our reproductive endocrine organs. So a ovary, which is typically found in females, and testes, which are typically found in males.